Hello, this is Andrew with Mimillion Dead Bike, and this is a set of Engo sunglasses. We're gonna go and then unbox this. Uh, this came from France today. A friend of mine bought these, and he was generous enough to let me do the initial unboxing and like a first look thing before he takes over and actually starts using them. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. So obviously it comes pretty well packed in this box there. You get a nice plastic bag. And then we have the uh, box itself. So there are a few different elements to making this work, uh, but let's get it unboxed first. first. So there's a little strip here that you gotta rip in order to um, get to the good stuff. So it opens up, got a nice little thing here. Uh, Ango is the company that makes the sunglasses. Active Look is the technology that projects the numbers onto the sunglasses. I believe the relationship is that Active Look licenses that technology to companies like Ango. There is a similar product that uh, is made for swimmers that also uses the Active Look technology. We'll get into like how all that stuff works more in a little bit here, but again, let's just dig a little bit farther in. Get a case, and let's see what else is underneath here. This box, this is probably charging cables. Yeah, so you get, what do you call these again? Are they called fogies maybe? I don't remember, I used, when I was in grade school, I wore glasses, and I was always losing my glasses or, um, breaking them doing stuff. And so my parents made me wear these <laughs> so that they wouldn't go flying off my head and I wouldn't lose them. And it made me um, very popular, let's just say. And uh, yeah, that was lots of fun. Anyway, here's the uh, charging cable. This attaches magnetically to the, uh, the glasses and we'll have a look at how that works in a second. These are cleaners and instructions, a cleaning cloth, and a nice bag that the glasses can go into. It's a great case, very protective. So here are the glasses. There are two versions of these glasses. This is the Engo 2. There's also an Engo 1. The Engo 1 was the first generation. They are physically different and they weigh a little bit more. The biggest difference though is that the Ango 2 are not photochromatic, whereas the Ango 1 are. The Ango 1 goes from, I think, levels 1 to 3. It makes it suitable from a low light, so effectively riding in the early morning or in the evening, to uh, a not very bright environment. And these are for riding. These are not photochromatic, but they are should be suitable for riding in very bright environments. So of course, we're going to test that. I should note that the Ango 1 are around $400, and these are around $330. You can go to the website, the Ango website, and sign up for a coupon. I think it's a 10% coupon that you get, which effectively knocks, what, like 30 or 40 bucks off. The, the price. So that is somewhat expensive, but getting that data up on your glasses so you're not looking down at the head unit can be critical at certain times, um, especially if you do a lot of structured training outside or if you're planning to use this during a race or something like that. And in the grand scheme of things, when looking at you know how much other stuff costs for cycling or racing or doing triathlon, or running a marathon, it's pretty easy to spend 300 bucks on a pair of shoes or you know, 300 bucks on whatever. The way that this works is that this thing here is actually a projector. And let's get a little bit of a close up there. This thing here, right there, that's a projector and it has a little micro LED screen inside of there that it writes the number two and then shines a light through it onto the lens. This works exactly like one of those old school rear projection televisions. Uh, maybe I'm 
dating myself or how old I am, but those are really popular at a certain point because you could get you know a big display off of a tiny little screen. Uh, in this case, you know, it uses micro LED instead of a DLP or an L LCD. Is that also a ambient light sensor, which would control how bright the the projecting light is on there. So, if, you know, if you're running riding in a low light environment, it's going to be a lot less bright than it would be if you were riding in a very sunny environment. That's super important because you wouldn't want your eyes to not have the right level of uh, pupil dilation uh, because you could, you know, not be able to, you, by viewing this, the very bright screen, you might miss really important uh, road hazards when you're riding or running or whatever. This connects using Bluetooth to your phone or to your, um, whatever your device is, your watch or your uh, head unit. And it's supposed to have a 12 hour battery, which should be fine for most use cases. The projector itself is supposed to be 13 grams. Um, obviously, I can't weigh that independently without destroying the device, but we'll get the um, glasses weight here in a second. And then the other feature that's present that we'll test for is there's some kind of gesture control, which lets you um, skip from screen to screen on the, on the glasses. I think I mentioned that on Garmin, you would use the Connect IQ app, and we'll kind of walk through some of that. There is a video that Active Look publishes on how to do that. I've watched that video. It's not the most approachable user experience. You have to like bang numbers in there and stuff. And there's a fairly limited set of uh, data metrics that you could put on the glasses. I wish there was more because the ones that I want to see aren't there. You, you can do three second power, but you can't do 10 second or 30 second power. I don't ride the three second power. I don't find it to be very useful. But if you do, then you're good. If you don't, that might be a concern for you. I sent an email to Active Look asking about that uh, about a week ago, and they have not yet responded. If they do respond uh, before this video goes out, I will put the whatever their response is over here somewhere. So let's quickly get weight here. And they are 41.5 grams. My recollection is that these are supposed to be 40 grams, so it's probably within acceptable tolerances there. The construction of these, um, I mean, you, maybe you can hear that. They're a little creaky. I would not say that the plastic here is the highest quality, not that that really matters, but uh, it is worth noting. For reference, I have a pair of the glasses that I, I wear. These are um, Tifosi, just normal cycling glasses, or active glasses, I probably should say, and they're 29.5. So the cost here is about 10 grams maybe, so not terrible at all considering the functionality. Before I get to testing them, which I guess is the most important thing, uh, I'm gonna quickly model them for you so you can kind of see what they look like. Obviously, I look very stylish here, so we're just gonna go with they look awesome and I look awesome in them. All right, so I spent several hours testing the Engo 2 glasses, both on the bike and then also outside um, in a running kind of situation. I'm gonna talk through all the different things that I've discovered, my impressions, all of that stuff, but I'm gonna break it into a few different chapters and I'll put some markers in, in the description so you can jump between them if you want to. Uh, we're gonna start logically with the first run experience and it's a little bit clunky. If you're using these with a, an app, use the app on your phone, you install it from like the Google Play Store or the Apple uh, App Store. It's not the most uh, polished user experience I do enjoy that they require, they actually force you to update the firmware on the glasses before you can do anything with it. Use the app to uh, figure out like where the display is and like you can move it around a little bit digitally. There isn't a lot of adjustment digitally though. So if you're in a position where you can't see it right, like if it's not in the right place, then you're kind of screwed. I fall into this category. Um, 
I can see it, like in, in normal operation, I can see it. It's kind of like right up here. I can't see the whole display without doing that, which, you know, makes them not super effective sunglasses and also, you know, <laughs> makes me look kind of weird. I, I don't know how to feel about that. Um, I think it's probably one of those things that for most people, or some people, maybe the majority of people, it'll be totally fine. For me, it was okay. Like I can't see everything, but you don't really need to see everything. So I, I could have, I can make it work, but it's not ideal. I should be able to adjust it so that I can see it. We'll talk more about the display when we get to the display section, but I just wanted to talk about that because it's part of the initial setup experience. As kind of clunky as that is, the setup experience with the Garmin Connect IQ app, which is how you um, see the numbers from your head unit or your watch on the display, is uh, not very polished at all. Basically, you have this Connect IQ app, and there are three different data fields, or sorry, there are three different sections for you to enter pages inside of a parenthetical with different numbers which correspond to, to metrics that come from the head unit and are then displayed on the screen. I will put the whole list of available metrics over here somewhere, or maybe over here, wherever. Uh, you can see that there's a lot of metrics, but it's not comprehensive in any way. Then you have to like put up that list of numbers somewhere, and then on your phone, just kind of like list, put them in the order that you want them to put them in, or you add, remove, whatever. It's not intuitive, and it's not super polished. Pretty sure I said that already. So before we get to digging into the display, let's talk about the physical characteristics or properties of the glasses. To charge it, you use this cable. There's uh, two electrical connectors and then two magnets. There are two places for the electrical connectors and then some magnets in there. You can't get this wrong. There's only one way to put it on. If you try to put it on the other way, the uh, magnets are polarized in, or the polarity is such that you just can't do that. So there's only one way to put it on and there's no way to get that wrong, which is awesome. So, you know, kudos to Ango for that. I do wish that the glasses themselves were um, a little bit heavier and possibly sturdier um, in the temples mostly. The problem is that given the way that these are designed is that there's an imbalance with the weight in the glasses. Most of the weight, or at least the way that it feels, is on the nose. So when you put these on, you can feel that weight on your nose. And I think that if they had made the temples heavier, then it would have feel more balanced because it, just because like the fulcrum wouldn't be here, it would be a little bit farther back. They probably did that because, you know, selling a 40 gram set of glasses is easier than, set, than trying to sell a 50 or 55 gram set of glasses. But I think that that on balance would have made a more comfortable set of sunglasses. Now that's not to say that they're uncomfortable. Uh, they, start, they aren't, not of the durations that I tested, but I could see that they might be if you start pushing the duration longer, like into like a longer race uh, or you know a long endurance session. It, it could be that. And I haven't put, I didn't push past two hours, so I don't know if at three hours, you know, there'd be a big problem or if you can make it to 10. I don't know the answer to that. The lens here is a level three and it does not appear to be polarized, which means that it should be fine in most lighting situations, but it won't be dark enough in very bright environments and it won't be light enough to use in a low light situation. Like you're not gonna ride it, you're not gonna be able to ride with these at night you're probably not going to want to ride with them around dusk or before the sun comes up. Although depending on you know where you live and how many mountains there are around you, it might be okay on either side of that. Uh, but it's something that I think is important to understand if you're going to get these. That said, they do sell the the one, the Ango One version, which has a 
photochromatic lens, it's more expensive, but it covers that range from one to three. So you, it gets as dark as these do, but then it's also gonna be totally fine in a very low light situation. I have a set of photochromatic lenses that do that one to three thing too, and they are totally fine to ride in you know, total darkness, as long as you, know, you have a light source. Now let's talk about the display. Unfortunately, I couldn't get uh, any good photographs, so I can't show you what it looks like in the photograph, so I'm just gonna kind of talk you through it. Two to three metrics seems to be the right number. Uh, I tried four, and that was too much. The text just gets too small to read easily, and um, I was getting mild eye strain from that. Now, that could be somewhat exacerbated by the position of the display, like right here. If it was a little bit farther over, then it wouldn't have been as difficult to kind of look over there. It wouldn't have taken as much cognitive effort to do that and wouldn't have taken the same kind of effort that it takes to focus on those, the text. But I do think that it's likely that it would be the same problem regardless of where the display was on the screen or on the, the lens. I, as I mentioned, I can't get the HUD, I'm just gonna call it a HUD, the heads up display, to be in, in the right position for me. Uh, so I'm always looking up and to the left. Um, that adds to the eye strain problem, even with two to three data fields, is it just a lot worse with four. It would be better, I think, if the display was a little bit farther down and to the right and if it operated more like um, the HUD in a car, where you just kind of train yourself to look through it, except when you want to look at it. And you know, you're, it's kind of weird the first time you use it, but then it's very natural um, to just kind of you know, adjust your focus to the appropriate uh, focal length. So you can see something, or you're gonna look through it. If you've never used a heads up display in a car, then it's very similar to like how you look through a screen door. You know, most of the time you don't even see the screen. You just look right through it. It's only when you really want to and you can like pull your focus in tight that then you would see like those cross members. I saw about 10% of battery consumption per hour of use, which would mean that it would get about 10 hours instead of the 12 hours that Engo claims. I don't know if that was because, you know, I was messing with a lot with like the gesture control or if there was, you know, something else going on. The gesture control, it changes the pages. You, you kind of have to move your hand very slowly or I guess the perfect amount of slowness in front of your face. It works from left to right or right to left, and, you know, to change the page this way or to change the, change the page that way. It, Okay, it's kind of clunky. I never got it perfect the first time. I always took a couple tries. I suspect it's the kind of thing that with more use and more focused training on you know, doing that and getting it right, it would probably get a lot easier. I'm not sure that I would ever see 100% success rate. I'm also not sure that it's really important. I don't know that I would really, I, di I didn't tend to spend a lot of time changing the pages because you know, there are numbers that are important and then there are numbers that really aren't. There is no official IP rating for the display or for the projector thing. I, so what I'm gonna say next is very much at your own risk. I asked Engo about it. They said that they expect to get at least an IP65, but they haven't had it validated yet, so you know. <laughs> That's a for what it's worth kind of thing. IP65 is effectively water resistant, which means it should be fine in the rain or most rain, but don't go swimming in them. The power consumption, or sorry, the power requirements to charge this are very low. I didn't do any serious um, testing. Ango claims half a watt of consumption while it's charging, and I think that they are probably right. That's about what I was seeing in some lazy testing with the tools that I have on hand. So now we get to the subjective part, the is there value here? I didn't use them long enough to do a proper review. So these are very much my first, first look kind of impressions. 
Uh, you need to interpret everything I'm going to say in that context. Some of these impressions may have changed if I had a more extended amount of time with the glasses. I think the main value here is for runners. Looking at my watch when I'm running is way more disruptive than when I'm looking at my bike computer. It's awesome to see the numbers I want to see up there, but, and this is a very big but, the glasses do not support run power from my watch. I don't have foot pods, so I didn't test that. And given that my watch does run power, I don't see the point in buying foot pods. Uh, it kind of blows my mind that they don't support run power, but it's just kind of one of those things that is what it is. That said, I, I don't run to run power yet. I haven't really figured out how to use it. Uh, I mostly just want to see heart rate and uh, SPM or steps per minute. Uh, one is for pacing and the other one is because I tend to overstride. I also like to see pace, but that's more of a curiosity thing. All three of those things are supported. So it's not a blocker for me personally, but I can see how it would be for someone else. On the bike, for me, I think the main value is in standing work, which would be uh, like workout intervals, or it could also be when you're trying to pace up a short climb in a race or a race-like group ride. There's probably other points of value for other cyclists from the glasses uh, that I may have discovered if I had spent more time with them. But I, th it's not really a hardship for me to kind of look down at my cycling computer when I'm down on the bars. It's just kind of natural for me to do that. You know, there are lots of ways that you can put your computer on the bike and everybody's workflow is different. So when I say that, I think the value is mostly for standing and for running. There, there's a, a quite possible wide array of things that I didn't think of or that just aren't something that I personally would see value in. The hesitancy around providing a recommendation here uh, should have been apparent, but that doesn't mean that I don't have some guidance uh, around the glasses. I think the most important thing to understand with the Ango 2 glasses is that they are a $30 to $40 pair of sunglasses with a $270 display attached to them. Don't expect $300 sunglasses because that's not what they are. What that means in practice is that the value here is going to pivot almost entirely around how much you like to see those numbers here because these are not like the most awesome sunglasses that you can buy. There are much better sunglasses for much less money that you could wear cycling, but none of them put the numbers here for you to see them. There is one section left, and fair warning, it's going to get really, really geeky. So I'm just going to say thanks for watching now. Uh, please like and subscribe and all that other stuff. And now let's uh, go to the geeky bit. So you remember how I said that we're going to get to the um, whole 10 second, 30 second power thing? Well, this is when we get to that. Active Look published the source code for their data field on GitHub. And that's what I've got here. And I'm going to, hopefully you can all see that over here somewhere. And we're going to kind of look at how they calculate th three second power and how they could add 10 second and 30 second power to that. This section here, in the function accumulate, if we look through here, we can see that what they're doing is that they have a queue-like uh, container. What they're doing is maintaining 30 samples within that uh, queue. It's important to understand that this should be one second, but it might not be because Garmin has an option to do something called smart recording uh, there's really no reason to use that on a modern device or <laughs> probably even older ones, but it used to be the default. So it's important to understand that that is a consideration that exists within this data field. Uh, but in most cases, it'll be one sample equals one second. And I did warn you that this is going to get geeky, so yeah.
So if we search for three, we can see that inside this function compute, they are looking at the queue, the sample queue, and then as long as there are more than three samples in it, they're grabbing the last three samples and then adding them all up and then dividing by three. That's this line here. Now, I don't know why they're doing it this way. It's definitely not the way that I would do it. And it's also not the right way if you want to calculate 10 and 30 second power. The better way to do that is to use a for loop. Look at that queue. As long as there are more than 10 samples, you can calculate 10 second power. And as long as there are 30 samples or more, you can calculate 30 second power, or sorry, 30 sample power. We go back up to accumulate. The easiest way to figure out all of this stuff, the three sample, 10 sample, or 30 sample power, is here we can see where they limit the size of the queue to 30. But then here, they're iterating through each one of those samples to create a sum. That's what this line here is doing. If instead of operating from the start of the queue to the end of the queue, if we just flip that around, so we start at the back and work our way towards the front, and we know that we've only got 30 samples in there, basically all you do is you just iterate through them. When you get to three samples, you stop calculating three, sec three sample power. When you get to 10 samples, you stop calculating 10 sample power, and then you just do the whole uh, queue for 30 second or 30 sample power. I haven't quite worked out how the uh, numbers that we saw earlier were like 10 equals three second power in the active look documentation. How those, how the, like 10, how that works, how that maps from 10 to three second. I didn't spend a ton of time looking at this. I think that it, you know, that should become obvious that if I were to spend a few hours looking at it, and it would be child's play for somebody who wrote it, like the people at Active Look, to add that functionality. In response to the email that I received from Ingo around the IP rating, I sent them this information and explained the, kind of like how you how they could ask Active Look to do this thing very easily. I haven't heard back around that. Um, if I do, I'll probably post about it or something. Uh, but it should be fairly easy for them to add 10 sample and 30 sample power if they want to. Anyway, I'm glad if you if you made it all this way, then thanks for geeking out with me. Cheers.